There are a lot of ways to prove that you're a fan, <laughs> but none of them are secretive or private. You can't be a fan in a closet, can you? It's about living out loud, being seen, supporting who you support. And if you're a supporter of Jesus, well, then the way you are going to be a fan is to follow. And I promise you that if you follow Jesus for long, that one of the ways that you will walk is the marginal way. And if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. What does it mean to be a new creation? We all yearn for renewal, but are we willing to pursue it? How is our own personal renewal connected to new creation in others, in our communities, and in the world itself? Tending means to lean in the direction of something. To attend to something is to nurture it, grow it, build it, pay attention. So this is what we will do as we journey toward the new creation Christ intends for us. Give thanks for Yahweh's goodness. God's love endures forever. Let these be the words of Yahweh's redeemed, those redeemed from the oppressor's clutches, those brought home from foreign lands, from east and west, from northern lands and southern seas. Some went down to the sea in ships, plying their trade across the ocean. They too saw the works of Yahweh the wonders that God worked on the deep. God spoke and raised a storm wind, lashing up the towering waves. Flung to the sky, they plunged to the depths in the ordeal of their courage melted away. They staggered and reeled like drunkards with all their skill adrift. Then they called to Yahweh in their trouble, and God rescued them from their sufferings reducing the storm to a whisper until the waves of the sea were hushed. Overjoyed with the calm, they were brought safe to the port they were bound for. Let them thank God for this great love, for the marvels done for all people. Let them praise God in the great assembly and give praise in the council of elders.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, let's see what Jesus is up to today. Oh, oh, playing some ball. <laughs> Jesus, you look like you're having fun over there. What are you doing? Evangel, what? Evangelizing. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, preaching, spreading good news. Hmm. I hate to tell you, Jesus, but you're not in a church preaching. Um, you're playing. Oh, 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 okay. All right, so he's telling us that preaching, evangelizing, is just showing people how to be happy, showing people how good it is to be loved and to spread love. Oh, well, that's easy. All you have to do is be a happy person, make other people happy, help other people. And by doing that, you're spreading God's love. Wow. Well, that doesn't seem so hard to do. Uh, Jesus, I have a present for you. I made you a t-shirt. It says, live out loud. I think that that's what you're trying to tell us. Live big, live out loud, show everybody God's love. Can we do that? I think we can. Wonderful. All right, let's do our body prayer together. <laughs> Generous God of abundant hope, we thank you for the new life that is ours as your people. Open our hearts to your love that we may be stirred to love others. Open our lives to your grace that we may live graciously in your world. When fear makes our lives small and cramped. Expand our hope in your realm of justice and mercy. Empower us to live courageously the faith to which we are called. journeying with you in the pathways of compassion. That lead us to an open and expansive life. Amen. As Christ's co-workers, we beg you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For God says through Isaiah, At the acceptable time I heard you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We take pains to avoid giving offense to anyone, for we don't want our ministry to be blamed. 
Instead, in all that we do, we try to present ourselves as ministers of God, acting with patient endurance amid trials, difficulties, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, and riots. In hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, we conduct ourselves with innocence, knowledge, patience, and kindness in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love with the message of truth and the power of God, wielding the weapons of justice with both right hand and left, regardless of whether we are honored or dishonored, spoken of favorably or unfavorably. We are called impostors, yet we are truthful. We are called unknowns, yet we are famous. We are said to be dying, yet we are alive. Punished, but not put to death. Sorrowful, though we are always rejoicing. Poor, yet we enrich many. We seem to have nothing, yet we possess everything. And we have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. We've opened our hearts wide to you. We're not holding anything back. You, on the other hand, are holding back your affection from us. It would be a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, if you'd open your hearts as widely to us as we do to you. You don't have to be a fan. In fact, you probably don't even ever have to have seen the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail to know that scene where the plague is about and someone's coming along with a wagon and calling, bring out your dead. And someone brings out an old man who proclaims, I'm not dead yet. Well, I couldn't help but think of that scene when I read this scripture. Paul is complaining to the Corinthians that he's not dead yet. There are rumors of his death, which are premature. He and his fellow apostles are being called imposters, but they're very much genuine. They're being called unknown, but they're actually a bit famous, maybe notorious or infamous, depending on your perspective. But here he is trying to persuade the Corinthians not to listen to all those voices around them. Sound a little familiar, doesn't it? Here he is being persecuted and having every reason to be sorrowful, but still full of joy. Here he is with next to nothing to give, but still enriching others. How does one do that? Well, one does that by being fully alive by being comfortable in their own skin, knowing that there is something to give because you are you. Proclaiming truth, bringing joy, being very much alive is the very best preaching you'll ever do. You might not even need words to do it. There are many things you can be a fan of, right? And I assume that if you cast about somewhere in your life, you can say you're a fan of something. Sports teams are the logical, most typical thing that we're fans of, right? And there are ways of being a fan. So the real question is, how do you fan, right? How do you go about being a fan? What does that look like? Are you just one of these people that, uh, you know, Everybody else is a fan, so you are too, right? You know, we live in New England. We're Red Sox fans, right? That's part of the culture. It's just part of the identity. Now, true fans will say, you might just be on the bandwagon, right? Of course, it was hard to be on that bandwagon for a long time before the curse was finally reversed, right? So, you know, you had to really, but, but that was part of the culture too, right? You suffered with the team or whatever. It was just part of identity. That, that's one way of being a fan. Um, and then, of course, there are those fans that when the team finally does start winning, jump on the bandwagon. Those are really popular with the hardcore fans, right? You just love when everybody's on the bandwagon. <laughs> it's kind of ironic. There are more people with you, but you're a little judgmental about them. But if you're a real, true, hardcore fan, you actually find joy in the journey, right? Even in the struggle, there's something about being committed and loyal. There's something about being 
a fan of the team that you just can't let go of, right? It's really inexplicable. It just is that way. And you're also, if you're a hardcore fan, able to question the team, but not the fans of the other team, right? They can't do that, right? That you reserve that judgment for yourself. You can say that your players are bums or the coach is an idiot, but they better not say that if you're a fan of the other team, right? Don't you dare insult our team. Our, uh, one of my favorites is when, you know, the, the bruiser, the guy that, that's the leg breaker on the other team, uh, and you hate him, and then he gets traded to your team, all of a sudden he's redeemed, right? <laughs> because he's one of ours. He's still a leg breaker, but he's our leg breaker, right? So it's okay. And there's always, always room to find hope when you're a fan. Even when that hope is just wait till next year, right? Because there's always next year. That's what it's like to be a fan. The goal may be for your team to win, but we know that that doesn't happen all the time. So the reward really is the community, the, the loyalty, the commitment, the feeling that you get from knowing that you've been faithful. Being faithful is its own reward, isn't it? And if there is no joy in any of this, then why do it? I grew up a fan of the Pittsburgh Pirates in the 70s, and one of the Hall of Fame famous players from that time was Willie Stargell. And Willie Stargell had this wonderful expression. He said, at the beginning of the baseball game, the umpire comes out and does not say, work ball. <laughs> the umpire says, play ball. It's a game. They're having fun. If you're not having fun, why do it? When I was in college, our housing group decided we were going to field a team to play intramural softball. And there was enough of us that we realized we could field two teams. And some of my fellow uh, classmates were interested in being competitive. And then there were some of us who weren't so interested in competition, more in having the fun. So we had two teams. We had the Gophers. And believe it or not, they were the serious team. <laughs> and we had the Wombats. I was a Wombat. <laughs> and at the end of the season, a weird thing happened. Both teams had almost identical records. <laughs> By trying to be serious and compete, they didn't have any more victories than we did just having fun. And in the end, we had a lot more fun. <laughs> now, religion is not a game. It's more serious than that, right? Somehow we, we lose the joy and the fun in our practice of religion because we're more gophers than wombats. Right? We take ourselves mighty seriously. But if we were to make the comparison, if the analogy were to carry over to religion, then winning would be the equivalent of a religion that has answers, that seeks answers, that seeks absolutes right and wrong, black and white, right? It would be something like that. Pretty tedious, actually. But then, if that's the case, when you reach the goal, you miss the reward. The reward of faithfulness itself, of community, of commitment, of loyalty, of knowing the gifts, of enjoying the practice of your faith. Somewhere there has to be a balance. Somewhere God is not just calling out work faith, but play faith. Be playful. Be alive. Have fun. Religion of absolute answers is like a team that looks good on paper. Right? Well, you know, they're going to win this year, the preseason. Like, well, this is the team because look at who they have. Look who did they sign. Look at their budget, yada, yada, yada. But they still play the games, don't they? And the teams that look good on paper don't always win the championship. And that's the way it can be if our religion is about looking good on paper, about having answers, about having everything tidy, having all of our doctrine and dogma in order. That doesn't necessarily help us live our lives. No, we can actually question the team. If you're a fan, you're allowed to ask the hard questions. You're allowed to critique the team you're on. And there you might find that uh, the answers don't always come. And that 
maybe you have to wait till next year to get the answers. And maybe that's okay. Now, you don't always get the answers you expect. That's also part of the problem. Those who think they can tell you exactly what you're supposed to believe find that they often paint themselves into a corner, right? If you believe A, then you have to believe B, then you have to believe C, and then you're like, but that means I have to believe this. That happened for me reading scripture. If I believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and that the Bible is the word of God from God to us, then when I read those ancient tales of the conquest of the promised land, I have to believe that the God that I worship today, being the same God that was worshiped then, has the ability to say, even today, kill everything with breath. I don't know about you, but I'm going to question a God who says that. I think it makes more sense to believe that the Bible is a history that, like all histories, is written by the victors, and that if I conquer another land by killing everyone and everything, then I am going to look for someone to blame, and God is a pretty good scapegoat there, huh? That makes a lot more sense when I read the Bible. Not that God is in favor of genocide, and that somehow it could be justified sometimes because, well, God made me do it. That's what happens when you play your faith that way, when you have all the answers. But sometimes we do get our backs up. We say, I want to know the answers. God, you owe me that, right? That happened to Job. Job had terrible, terrible, terrible things happen to him. And when his friends came to him, the first thing they did was sit with him and keep their mouths shut. And that was the right thing to do because he was suffering so much. Sometimes when we're suffering, there are no words, just presence, just comfort. And that's what his friends did, and it was wonderful for a week. Then they opened their mouths. And they convinced Job that he had a case. You didn't do anything wrong. You're righteous. As a matter of fact, when you read the book of Job, you find out that Job was the most righteous person on the face of the earth. And that is why all of this happened to him. Well, that doesn't seem very fair, does it? And Job finally gets his day in court at the end of the book of Job. He stands before God and he basically says, that wasn't fair. Tell me why. And what does God say in response? We heard it in the scripture today. Oh, where were you when I was creating the world? Do you know the mysteries of the universe? Do you know when the goats give birth on the mountains? Do you know how uh, the, the monsters live in the deeps of the sea? No, you don't. You don't know. And you don't need to know. It's not the most comforting end of the story. I don't know if you realize that's how the book of Job ends <laughs> with that. But what... God is saying to Job in that moment is, these answers are enough. Yes, ask the question, but marvel that you don't know the answer. Be in awe that the universe and all of creation is so much bigger than you are, and that there is so much beyond your understanding, and yet it still works. And that even in the end, after all that suffering, Job finds a way to survive and is blessed in the end. Sometimes you have to wait till next year and the answer comes along and it may not be the one you expect. That's what Job teaches us. Job teaches us that it's okay to question because questioning is a form of wondering and wondering leads to awe even when the answers are just mystery. Now Paul writes to the church in Corinth a lot. We read from the second letter to the church in Corinth. And if we have two in existence that we're still reading today, you kind of have to wonder how many he wrote. <laughs> and always reading these epistles, as they're called, these letters in the New Testament, reading them is like reading half of the, the uh, email chain, right? You don't know what, what the person said in response. We don't know what the Corinthians said to Paul to evoke what Paul wrote. But you do fill in the gaps. You read between the lines. And what we have figured out about the church in Corinth is they didn't get along real well. There are factions within the church there. 
Some said that they belonged to this faction. Some said they belonged to that faction. Some felt that they were better than others. They would get together for the meal and some would eat first and they'd be drunk by the time others came. And the people who were hungry didn't get to eat because they didn't show up on time and they didn't worry about that. These are the, these are the marks of this wonderful church in Corinth. We don't know any churches like that though, right? We don't know any churches that have faults. <laughs> but what they also seem to do was to discount what Paul and the apostles, his team, his evangelistic team, he, they discounted his message. They, they tried to fence him in to, to put limits and a fence around the message itself. They seemed to think that they had all the answers. Again, sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? They saw Paul and his team as limited, as poor and persecuted, even as imposters. What could they possibly give? Paul. Paul, the one who had created the church in the first place. Paul, who was doing all this suffering on their behalf, going around doing all this work on behalf of the gospel, but they knew better, didn't they? And they put him down. And they didn't think that he had anything to say. But Paul and the apostles, to their credit, just lived their lives. And Paul points out, I have been persecuted, yes. I have nothing, and this is on your behalf. You say that I'm dead, but I'm not. You say that I'm fake, but I'm authentic. They were living out loud, finding and proclaiming and giving joy. Finding and proclaiming and giving love. Finding and proclaiming and giving life in the midst of the struggle. Because that's all that we can ever do, is be faithful and follow. To be genuine fans of the team that we're following, the Jesus team. And we don't always have the answers, and sometimes we have to wait till next year. That's just the way it is. But if we live out loud, if we show our true colors, if we don't hide the fact when the things aren't going well, that we're a fan of this team, that we are indeed Christians, that we follow Christ, and we live our lives in that way, then we become the open book that people will read. We become the only Bible some people will ever know. Paul and his team didn't have absolute answers. They didn't give doctrine and dogma much as we like to say that that's what the New Testament does for us. They lived out loud. They believed that truth could be known and it should be sought. And they believed that there was indeed a power that is greater than any of us and can be known in small ways and big, wonderful ways that fill us with awe. And they believed not only that love does not, cannot, and never fails, but they also believed that love always wins even if you have to wait till next year. Amen. You know
up and 